expansion of the disability tax credit. And NDP leader Jagmeet Singh pledges to make child care universal by 2030. It's time to have your say. I'm Mark Sutcliffe. Welcome to the program. Liberal leader Justin Trudeau traveled to the heart of Doug Ford Nation yesterday to announce his party platform. The Liberals have pledged a wide array of spending promises targeted at middle-class voters, including boosting the Canada Child Benefit, increasing student loan grants, and reiterating a promise to create a national pharmacare plan. The $57 billion plan projects deficits of more than $20 billion per year over the next four years, adding $31.5 billion in new debt to previous forecasts. So our question of the day, how important are budget deficits or the national debt in deciding your vote? You can call us at 1-877-296-2722. Tweet us at CPAC underscore TV or send us an email at have your say at cpac.ca. In Whitby this morning, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer was asked about when his party would release its fully costed election platform, and he responded by criticizing the Liberal plan. On the Trudeau platform announcement yesterday, Canadians saw yesterday exactly how life will get more expensive under a Justin Trudeau government. Higher taxes, endless deficits, bigger bills, less money in your pockets. That is the exact same platform as Kathleen Wynne, but with canoes. That's what we saw yesterday. Less than half of the promises even cost it. I don't even know if you can call that a platform. Uh, we have committed to unveil our platform with plenty of time for Canadians to, uh, to, to make decisions to go through it. It will be in plenty of time for the vote. It will be well ahead of Election Day, well, and it will be uh, before the advance polls. Uh, but again, as I said, yeah, I don't even know if we can call that a platform from yesterday. Uh, he has made billions of dollars in uncosted promises that will force him to either raise taxes, break promises, or break the bank. So uh, I don't have any confidence in what was unveiled yesterday. But your second question about the costing. We will show Canadians exactly how we get back to balanced budgets. We've already announced that we will eliminate $1.5 billion worth of wasteful corporate welfare. We will pull Canada's funding out of the Asian Infrastructure Bank. Uh, we'll be making further announcements as to where we disagree with where Liberals have been spending money. Uh, and uh, Canadians can see exactly how we'll get back to balanced budgets while leaving more money in their pockets. So what do you think? We are interested in your opinions today on Have Your Say. Joining us for the discussion are freelance journalist Dale Smith, author of The Unbroken Machine, Canada's Democracy in Action, and Katie O'Malley, a contributor to iPolitics. Welcome to both Thanks of you. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having Good us. to see you both. And uh, Dale, what do you think about this uh, liberal platform, fully costed now, that shows even bigger deficits after the Liberals ran in 2015 on a promise to run $10 billion deficits and then balance the books by this year, and then they didn't do that. Uh, I think we need to start thinking about deficits differently than we have been. We're still kind of mired in this mid-90s thinking about when there was an actual debt crisis in this country. That's no longer the case. And so we're now at a, po a point where 30-year bonds are cheaper than the rate of inflation. So it's practically free money for government. So it gives them the fiscal opportunity to invest in, in things that they might not have thought of beforehand. And, you know, with the last four years in this government, they've done things like move the needle on child poverty, for example, in a significant way that they haven't in decades before that. So I think those are conversations we should be having. Katie, do you think we have moved past that era and that uh, the era of having a balanced budget or a plan to return to balance at some point is over? Well, I think you have to separate the two. There's the actual economic decision, and as Dale says, you can make a pretty good case that it is not a crisis. But I always look at it as almost more a psychological issue because I think a lot of voters, even if they're not necessarily sure that a plan is going to work out exactly how the political party putting it forward is saying, because let's face it, they all get into office and then, oh no, the books are so much worse than we thought. But they like the idea that they have you know, a strategy. They like to see numbers. They like to see costing. It kind of says you're serious about you know, having your 
your party run for office. You're serious about forming government, you kind of got a plan. So I, I think it's almost more a, a credibility issue in putting one out there and defending it and having it there with substance than whether or not you actually live up to it. Right. Uh, and of course, uh, who knows if they will live up to it because everything changes. Yeah. Uh, the, the, these are just forecasts after all. They're, they're not, uh, uh, they're not uh, locked in stone. Um, but uh, how do we avoid, Dale, a, a future debt crisis if we keep adding to the debt? Well, that's partially why uh, the Liberals in particular have pegged their figures to the declining debt-to-GDP ratio. So as long as we can ensure that our economy is growing faster than our, our, our debt is, then that's creating that... Um, system where so it's not going to mean future taxes because the amount we're paying on the debt is still uh, is, is declining in that regard. Does that mean that we can just continue to borrow and we never have to pay it back basically? Uh, so long as the markets are in a certain condition then we do we can borrow sustainably uh, it's just a question of ensuring that we do have those kind of uh, anchors around something like the debt to GDP ratio to ensure that it is sustainable and not um, something that where your debt is growing faster than your economy is. Right. From a political perspective, mm -hmm. Katie, uh, uh, you saw, we saw Andrew Scheer criticizing it a few m moments ago. Uh, again, everybody thought in 2015 when Justin Trudeau said, I'm going to run $10 billion deficits, that no, that was a mistake. He yeah, lost the election. It was all over. It was like day <clears throat> yeah. three, and we just declared him a write-off. Yeah. So I always, I always think about that when I'm, uh, I'm tempted to make predictions. But, yeah, I mean... It's interesting because the Liberals have, they're almost trying to, to give, or give two contradictory messages because on one hand, yeah, they're open about putting out a plan that does not have a clear path to get back to balance that would run deficits and they're defending that and saying, but look, at, we're not just going to take the money and set it on fire. We're going to invest in things that we care about and that you care about as Canadians. You're going to get value back for the money. At the same time, I do think that they want to be seen, as Dale says, as keeping one eye on that GDP and making sure that this is sustainable. So they kind of have to walk both paths in terms of putting it forward. But yeah, I, I wonder sometimes if the Liberals may have made a conscious long-term decision to stop making the debt central and deficit central to their pitches going forward, starting in 2015 and now continuing onwards, because it really does kind of limit you as a party when you're trying to put together a platform. Right. And uh, but maybe it should. I yeah, mean, there so are like, people who are saying, really like, case, you know, yeah, you don't necessarily want governments to have a blank check yeah. either, right? Uh, no, for sure. And at the same time, we also have to look at what it is they're spending that uh, that money in the deficit mm -hmm. on. And there, there's a case to be made for them doing things like childcare, where you have an economic uh, outcome out of that. Um, we we saw that happen in Quebec, where. The more that childcare is made available, the more women could be in the workforce. These are kinds of investments that governments could make with that kind of spending room. Right. Also, infrastructure being a good example of something that people, even people who don't love the idea of running a deficit and building up the debt, they probably do appreciate the idea that you know the the, the main road in town that's been falling apart for decades is finally going to get resurfaced and repaved. Those are things that actually meaningfully affect people on a local and on a personal level. So yeah, I think there is uh, there tends to be some forgiveness simply saying you know we're going to spend like drunken sailors and we have no plan to get back to balance. No, that's not super popular, but if you can actually explain what you're doing, people are probably more willing to give you a chance at least, or at right. least a hearing. But once upon a time, the threshold was balanced budgets. Uh, if the threshold is not balanced budgets anymore, where is the threshold? When does it become irresponsible to be borrowing money, or how much money can you borrow uh, responsibly? Well, the, the IMF figure or threshold has been debt to GDP ratio, so that seems to be what the Liberals mm -hmm. are, are kind of um, honing in on. And I, again, you know, as long as they can make the case that that ratio is is on a continual decline, I think then that uh, that kind of uh, insulates them a little bit from some criticism. Right. But if the economy starts to turn in a different direction, does that change things? Uh, it might. It might make them think about cutting back on some of their um, like expanding some of their promises uh, in the in the meantime. Right. But isn't the challenge the fact that if the economy starts to go down, that's actually when governments like to borrow money to stimulate the economy. Right. So if you want to keep the debt-to-GDP ratio in line, you're restricted from doing that potentially in, during that kind of time. Potentially, right? unless they make the case that, you know, this is the time now we, where we need to stimulate. So right. it can increase a little bit. Which I'm sure bit. they would. But yeah. Yeah. 
um, because obviously there are there are limits. If 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 there's no problem borrowing money anymore, then they they could run two hundred billion dollar deficits, right? And I mean, if if that's the issue, right? I mean, if that's the issue, but I mean, it's also two hundred billion in regards to what size of the economy? Yeah, um, twenty billion is practically a rounding error in the size of our economy, and we could look to the states where they're running a trillion dollar deficit right now. So, you know, what what is the twenty billion in comparison to? Can we conclude there is no more political price to be paid then for running deficits? I think as long as you can come forward with a credible rationale for why you're running a deficit and something approaching, you know, at least an intent to get back to balance, all else being equal, if your plan is decent, people are not, that's not going to be a deal breaker. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're not able to make the case and to sell it, or if you get yourself in a position like some parties do, I'm thinking of the NDP in 2015, of you're the one who kind of says, well, it's all about the balanced budget, and then you fail to live up to sort of the threshold that you met because it turns out it was, you know, unsustainable. You couldn't actually promise the things you wanted to promise without, you know, making some cuts. So it's all theoretical. But I think that parties can almost box themselves into a corner if they make too big a, a deal over over this notion of balanced budgets without taking into account, hey, how will this actually affect the agenda that I would want to implement if I were elected? But uh, the Liberals last time around did have a plan to balance yes, the budget. They, they did. didn't meet it. Uh, this time around, they don't, right? The, Justin Trudeau has basically possibly said... Possibly because had they come out with one, people would have been like, hey, wait a minute, what happened right. to that last plan? So yeah, probably a good decision to, uh, to drop that notion. I will be interested to see if they're more uh, forthcoming, the Prime Minister's more, or the Liberal leader's more forthcoming in future, I'm thinking in the days and weeks ahead, as to having a plan. Because he's really been sidestepping the issue. There's nothing specific in the document. But at the same time, they've kind of hinted that, oh, you know, more numbers to come, more data. So I do think he's going to have to develop a better answer than just sort of... Whenever? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, the, well, the Liberals seem to have a, an inability to communicate their way yeah, out of a wet paper bag. There is so that. uh, that's kind of to their own detriment in that regard. Yeah. Uh, there are other things going on on the campaign trail as well. Uh, Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, is talking about creating childcare spaces. Uh, quick reaction to that? Uh, I would have assumed he'd already promised that. That's like the ultimate NDP promise, you know, pharmacare, right. childcare spaces, it's, which doesn't mean there's anything wrong with it. It's probably very much in tune with what his base wants to hear. It's very much in line with uh, New Democrat philosophy. I do wonder if the NDP are suffering from the uh, extremely minor but still occasionally annoying consequences to having unveiled their platform so early. Because now, they, they did it in, I believe it was August? They had, you know, the big to-do and they launched it and it was out there, but it means they're somewhat limited in terms of new announcements and new policy that they can come forward. They can do specifics on things that weren't uh, laid out in detail in the platform, but you do, you, you pay a price for going early and part of that is you end up announcing things that people are like, didn't you already announce that? Right. Dale, your thoughts on that? Uh, my thought is primarily that this is yet another promise that is in an area of provincial jurisdiction, and there's mm -hmm. nothing that he's announced that lays out his implementation strategy for how he is going to work with the provinces in order to get that. It's the same with pharmacare. It's the same for dental care. Uh, it's the same for housing. Right. Um, these are all areas of provincial jurisdiction, and so unless he, you know, there, there is the, the, the apologists who will say, oh, but a pr province isn't going to say no to, to this kind of money, but they will if it means having to set up a huge bureaucracy in order to create the social program on their turf. Okay, let's see what our viewers think about some of what we've been talking about, including the issue of deficits and debt. We'll take a call from Jeff in Hamilton, Ontario. Hello, Jeff. Yeah, uh, hello. Uh, Hi. Thank you for taking my call again. I, I like to participate. Um, paying down the debt is not really that important to me because, first of all, anybody that gets in government is going to run a debt. We inherited the Stephen Harper... Uh, debt, and we put ours on top of that. Um, I think spending money on the people, the children, and taking them out of poverty and helping people get ahead, we're going to run a deficit, obviously. I think what the gentleman said, we're going to the GDP ratio to our debt. We can pay it down, and any oil that we sell to Asia or whatever, we put in climate control. If they spend wisely, I agree with it. If not, then forget about it. But I think reasonably, though, we have to run a bit of a deficit to help the people out. And that's just the way I feel about it. Thanks. Okay, Jeff, thank you for your call. Bob in Chilliwack, British Columbia. Hello, Bob. Okay, we're connected. Okay. Yep. Um, she said be uh, disciplined. Um, if we're going to run a deficit to fix things that we have to fix, and uh, Indigenous First Peoples, that's uh, the priority for me. That is going to be an expensive bill no matter what. And if we got to go into debt to repair that people, which we broke deliberately, 
then fine. But if you're going to do deficit spending over and over again and invest as what's been uh, sold us, then I would suggest you be more disciplined, much more disciplined with your, uh, with your spending and habits in the operation of governments than we have been to date. Because I've seen things at committees where uh, suppliers are arranging contracts under reporting thresholds and all these little things and how um, far are when people try to make heads or tails of them, it's, it's gone backwards instead of forwards. So if, if we're going to run and over again and we're going to, quote, unquote, invest in these things that need investing in, infrastructure, child care, and the big bill for me, which is Indigenous people, I would say we should be a lot more careful than we are being to date with the money that we're borrowing, more so than if we were running cash ahead. And uh, the debt-to-GDP ratio, I'm not very comfortable with that. And that says to me that your panel member there that says, well, that's a good thing to go by, I, I would rather deal with the true weight of the debt. I, I heard this morning it was over $700 billion now at the federal level. Well, the weight of that constraint can catch up with you, even though it may reflect a low number compared to uh, the value of GDP. So I don't think it is safe as, as he did. And because the problem that I have, a lot of this cabinet and a lot of people, <clears throat> say the age of, of that panelist, is that their entire professional lives have been revolving debt maybe up to this point. Most of the financial services in this country seem to be, from the outside looking in, designed to keep you rolling in debt, keep you spending their money for a fee, rather than allowing you to catch up and then start working with your own capital, unless you're operating on a very large scale, like an inheritance, or you're born into a family, or whatever other situation that puts you over a certain threshold that allows you to run totally ahead. So you, does that kind of make sense to anybody? Sure. Or not? No, I hear what you're saying. Bob, thank you very much for your call. Um, let's, let's deal with a couple of those points, Dale. Um, uh, I mean, when you're adding to the debt, of course, you're increasing the cost of borrowing money. Right. And some people argue, well, that means in the end we're going to be spending more on interest every year, and that takes away from the money we can spend on health care, education, climate change, other priorities. Uh, it, again, it's it's depending on what you're borrowing at. Right now, we're able to borrow at, you know, I think a 30-year bond is like 1.6% or something like that. So if the rate of inflation is 2%, that's the target rate of inflation, then um, that that's pr pretty much free money uh, for a government. Uh, so we, you know, there there is that, that consideration to be made as well. Uh, I also saw a figure yesterday from an economist, I believe it was Kevin Milligan, who said that even if we paid down the, the debt and the deficit, the per capita gain in terms of what we'd save in interest is something like $43 per person a year. So it's really not a lot um, in, in terms of where we are in our, in our fiscal state right now. Right, but it is still money. It we pay out money. every year for interest, right? But there, it's the opportunity cost there as well. Yeah. And this is where I think it gets into the psychological issue because we as human beings, if we are running a debt and if we're looking at our line of credit or our credit card bill going up and up in those interest rates, we tend to get nervous, we panic. That's not a good scenario. That's not a good situation. It's something we should fix. There's a tendency to think, well, obviously governments should operate on the same logic. And that's not always true because it turns out that running a government is not like running a family or a business. It's running a government. It is a separate thing. But I do think that that's why politicians have to be really clear and really careful to take that into account when they're explaining to people why it is that, yeah, the plan I'm putting forward, if I were, you know, going to a bank and putting this forward to get a loan, they would laugh me out of the place, but it makes sense for a government and here's why. If you've got that message, then people will listen to you and they might give you uh, the benefit of the doubt. If not, it does start to remind people of, you know, terrible financial decisions they've either made or almost made in the past themselves. Okay, let's take a call from Harry in Kirkfield, Ontario. Hello, Harry. Hello. Hi. This is Harry Upton in Kirkfield. Um, all the discussion on the economy and about maintaining a deficit, it's going to take a back seat to uh, the issue of global warming. Um, a large deficit is going to be a severe burden in the near future when the most important task is going to be to <clears throat> maintain a reasonable standard of living in the, the environment, like all the scientists have, have told us that uh, in just a few years, that uh, that's gonna be the main concern for everybody is this here global warming and the severe storms and uh, the environmental issues, our crop failures and things like that. 
So, so how do you connect the two, Harry? What are you, what are you saying in terms of well, what, what how I'm one relates to the other? Our main concern now, politicians should be, we've got to tighten our belts and we're going to have to let go of, of a lot of social programs in order to pay down the debt so that we're not encumbered with that when we need to have, like there's going to be uh, people asking for money for this and for that, and there's just not going to be money for that, and it's going to ruin the whole country. So you're saying the money won't be there in a time of crisis because we're already yeah, borrowing yeah, so much money now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much for your call. Um, we're interested in your comments on that or any other topic that's come up over the course of this campaign. Uh, Katie, what about uh, the platforms and where we stand with that? We saw Andrew Scheer, the Conservative leader, being asked questions about when his platform will be released to mm -hmm. the public. He's saying it'll be before the... It'll be before voting, it'll be before advanced, the advanced polls. polls. So I start, think that means is, basically in the next like week and a half. It's yeah, fairly the soon. The advanced polls, I think, start next... I think it's well, they, the they're Thanksgiving the weekend. Okay, Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, not a lot of time. I'm unsure why they decided to put themselves in the position of being the last party to release the platform because it basically guarantees that it will continue to be a subplot every time he appears the question will be well where's your platform well right. everyone else has released their platform where's yours so it's an odd decision to make but for whatever reason that's the one that they've kind of chosen to go forward with yeah and what do you think dale about uh, the timing and release of the platform so far um I, I think there is, it's a delicate balance. Like Katie yeah. said, you don't want to go too soon because then you've got nothing to announce and you don't want to go too late because then you get hounded with questions about where the, you know, where it is. I mean, we saw the Liberals, despite saying that, yes, they've, they've got all their costing coming out at once, people kept asking every day, where's the costing, where's the costing, and said, it's coming, it's coming. So I, it, you kind of uh, leave yourself vulnerable to like that as well. It's almost like a party. You don't want to be first to arrive, and you don't want to be the last to leave. You want to be somewhere in the middle and kind of get there. And the Liberals may have left it a little bit long, but at least they are ahead of the Conservatives. Uh, the Green Party may have actually hit the timing perfectly. They did it, I think, a week into the campaign, and that might have been the sweet spot in terms of of doing it early enough that it seems fresh and like you're enthusiastic to release it without doing it so early that it's forgotten by the time the right. campaign starts. But then again, I mean, they also re re released their costing yes. days or, or a week later, and right. then that wound up being that kind of a, good. yeah, that, that kind that of ended up badly. being a problem as yes. well. So. Yeah. so we're roughly halfway through the campaign, Dale, uh, give or take a day. Um, what, what's your sense of what this election is about? If we Do we even know that yet? Uh, it's hard to say. I mean, the parties have tried to make this about affordability um, using some kind of dubious figures in order to justify that, that narrative. Um, others have tried to make it more about, you know, ethics and, and whatnot. Um, I, but that hasn't played out a lot in what we've seen. Um, and as a result, I'm really, you know, struggling to find what the actual narrative really has been shaping up to be. Um, other than perhaps uh, a referendum on the government uh, and their performance to date, which right. is which is fair for an election, which is not unusual. Uh, elections are about you know accountability in the sure. uh, long run. And elections aren't as much as we strive to identify a ballot question. Th uh, there have been elections where that's been the case. Uh, the 1988 election, of course, was largely viewed as a as a referendum on free trade with the United States, although there may have been people who were voting for different mm. reasons in that election. Uh, but you can have an election where everybody's voting for different reasons and, or and where they're all... just Yeah, they're generally voting on who do I think would make the yep. best government? Am I basically happy with what we've seen so far? Do I want to give someone else a chance? I don't think elections necessarily have to be about one particular thing. I think they can cover a bunch of themes. It really is up to the parties and to the party leaders most uh, uh, directly to kind of suggest that on all questions that might come up over the next four years, if you give me the majority I need to to run, to, to be able to pass legislation, you can trust me. I've got credibility. Maybe I haven't addressed every single issue that you have, but I want you to think that I'm someone you would put in charge of government or leave in charge of government if you have new liberals. And that being said, I think it's also a byproduct of the fixed election date mm -hmm. is that um, because when you had a floating election date, you could make an election about an issue. And when you are stuck to a date on a calendar, it makes it hard to come up with uh, a narrative that You're will just suit it. Renewal. Yeah, right. It's basically okay. Here's the renewal time. Here's yeah. our pitch. Here's everyone else's. Make a decision, Canadians. Yeah. All right. Keith is calling from Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Hello, Keith. Yes. Thanks for taking my call. I, I have a slightly different perspective. 
Um, I've decided to decline my ballot this year, so I will take a ballot but not select a candidate. And I've made that decision for different reasons, one being that, from my perspective, our electoral system is broken. And by that I mean that uh, over 50% in the last election, and generally speaking, over 50% of uh, votes cast by Canadians elect no one. And in the last election, in 2015, for example, it took twice as many votes uh, to elect a NDP MP than, a, than a, um, a Liberal MP. So our system is broken, and because it's, we have a broken system, it influences how we are governed, and it also influences our campaign. So I would describe this campaign as a very sanitized campaign. Um, very targeted, they, very targeted in terms of what riding, et cetera, and targeted in terms of debate. So elections should be a time where we have uh, our local candidates and our leaders participating in debates. And our prime minister had no problem participating in the monk debate in 2015. And in fact, he, uh, the Liberal Party, uh, were uh, outraged that the uh, conservative leader, uh, Stephen Harper, was not going to participate in certain debates. Now we move it four years ahead, and now we have the prime minister saying, well, I'm only going to participate in one English debate. I'm not going to participate in the McLean's TV, City TV debate. I'm not going to participate in the Monk debate. And to me, this is not democracy, So, but it flows from how we elect our government. So. Because we have a broken system, it affects how we are governed, and it affects these campaigns. So right. I'm paying little attention to the to the campaign and the promises because they really don't mean anything to me under our system, I hate to say. Okay, Keith, thank you very much for your call. Let's talk about that for a moment. Um, is, is our system broken, in your view, Katie? No, uh, I'm I, sorry, this comes down to electoral reform, which is a debate. I was literally thinking this morning, gosh, it's weird having we, have, we haven't yeah. heard a lot about electoral reform in terms of the campaign trail. There's always going to be Well, that's because the 2015 election was the last under first pass. Exactly, and now oh, we wait. have, yes. Yeah. But I, I'm actually, I'm interested, the Liberals don't seem to be facing quite as much scrutiny on that as I might have expected. Now, right. it's entirely possible that is happening more at the local level but I, in terms of sort of the, the the leader's circuit it doesn't seem to be as as much of an issue as I think I would have expected I do understand the frustration um, particularly over the debates and the fact that the, the uh, that the liberal leader is only going to attend one English I don't think that that's how the liberals would have preferred this to come out honestly I think they would have preferred having one English and one French and that's it but sure. because KVA isn't part of the consortium and they didn't want to snub that they ended up having to add that to the schedule so it is it is an awkward scenario but yeah I uh, I can understand why people are disappointed and why they would like to hear more but in terms of uh, I don't like people going to the polls or not going to the polls and sort of thinking my vote doesn't matter because your vote does matter. It does count. It is going to right. be tallied up and a result is going to come. At the same time, declining your ballot is a totally legitimate way to sure. indicate your dissatisfaction. So do that too. But as you point out, uh, you, you shouldn't think that if you don't vote for the candidate who wins that your vote doesn't count. No, it's, a right? num it, it's, not... it's taken into account with the overall yeah. vote share. <laughs> it's used as sort of a marker. It's something that the parties will look at in future yeah. and say, hey, look, Look how close we came in that riding, and it is true that it's a targeted message. Plus, you're message. participating even if you're not on the winning yeah. side, yeah, right? Exactly. Uh, the, you know, the only, uh, you know, people play uh, pick up hockey all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not a waste of time if you lose, no, right? Exactly. Yeah. You know, and there are many, many other examples you can you can cite um, a business people who start a business and it doesn't succeed after a few years, and then they go on and do something else. Uh, it doesn't mean your your uh, that democracy fails if you if you vote and you don't pick the winning side. That's yeah. part of the process. <laughs> it is, and I mean, this is this is partially what I what I wrote my book about was the fact that the system's not actually broken, but we don't understand how it works properly, and that's why we start thinking it's broken. Right. His example of you know 50% of people. Who, who cast a ballot didn't uh, elect someone who won. 
is is kind of based on a, a logical fallacy in terms of of what we conceive of elections. You know, an election is not one event; it's 338 simultaneous separate events. Right. And unless you actually conceptualize it in that way, you start thinking that you know it's not fair, but it's it's broken. But you you have to realize that it's not actually how it works. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, that's and I'm going to use another sports analogy here, but you can. Uh, you can you can have one team that scores you know the, uh, two goals in every game, and loses every game of the year, and you can have another team that scores one goal in every game and actually gets some wins, but loses some other games, right? Because yeah. you can lose three to two a whole bunch of times, and that team that only gets one goal per game wins one nothing, and at the end of the year you might say, well, that's not fair because the first team that didn't win any game scored more goals, but it's not about scoring goals. Yeah. It's about winning games, and that's and, where it and, does. And it's a, the electro, the, our electoral system is about winning ridings. It's not about the total vote across the country. We focus all the time on the percentage mm -hmm. the Liberals got, the Conservatives got, the NDP yeah. got, but it's not about the total number of ballots cast across the country. It's about a, a series of individual races in ridings. Exactly. And I think that that's where the misunderstanding comes in. And, yeah. But that is why I would love to see more focus on local candidates and local issues, which is something that I totally get that people are frustrated that there's not as much of it as they'd like to see. There are any number of reasons why that might be the case. But it is, a, it is an entirely fair complaint as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Uh, will we ever hear about electoral reform again, do you think? I do, I'm sure I'm hearing about it on Twitter right now as people are yelling at me for mentioning right. it as something that, that isn't an issue. But yeah, it doesn't seem as though it's really coming yeah. forward. I think the Green Party has mentioned it, not surprisingly. Um, the NDP has, as I think they've, they've made a commitment as well, but in terms of a key issue, I'm not sure it's going to make it up there. I think the NDP has tried to peg it as something they want if they were to um, uh, need support uh, for uh, mm -hmm. uh, in a hung parliament. But again, I don't think that people necessarily actually properly read through the report that the committee came out uh, at the end of the process that uh, the, the that was started in the last parliament, yeah. the electoral reform committee. Uh, the recommendations that came out of it were pretty much an impossibility um, that they heaped on the government, and as a result, the government, you know, had had no actual ability to do anything with it, and that was why I think it ended up being abandoned. Yeah, you'd think if if we're not going to have a debate about electoral reform in the first election after a winning party promised to scrap the current system of voting and didn't do it, broke the promise on that, and nobody's seeing that as an opportunity, that, that tells me that the other parties don't sense that, that uh, there's enough appetite for change on electoral reform, notwithstanding the last call, uh, for them to, to really score a lot of points there. And that's what public opinion polls have tended to show. If you, if you buttonhole someone and ask them, do you think this system is fair, they will usually end up you know, coming out in favor of a more representative system. But that doesn't mean it's high on their list of priorities if right. they're not confronted with And there's with no it. consensus think, on what system Yeah, that well, would exactly. Yeah. Then you yeah. get into this nightmare scenario. And the whole notion of a referendum to decide on the system. I think it's the idea of a government being put into power and then coming forward with an electoral reform proposal without having at some point a referendum on that proposal is a non-starter. I'm just not sure that's something that can happen. It's really difficult to see where there would be the credibility to do that. And there have been successive losses mm -hmm. on provincial ball uh, in provincial governments where they've attempted to Put for or put forward electoral reform, and it's been loss after loss after loss, and eventually, yeah. um, that you would hope the message starts to sink in that you know Canadians actually aren't interested in this, but there is a very vocal core who keeps trying to push it and keeps trying to insist that we just don't know what we're talking about. Um, that yeah. everything would be great look, if we I just adopted it. I know there's it, nobody so. here to defend uh, electoral reform, I, uh, but uh, there, there have been on other editions of the program. I, I just find it interesting because we don't apply the same logic to other areas. You know, if you have 10 people um, and they're all deciding, hey, what restaurant do we want to go to tonight? And eight of them all want to go to one particular restaurant. Nobody thinks, well... We should spend we'll twenty. Dessert. We'll get yeah, dessert we'll, at the we'll spend place. twenty percent of our time at the other restaurant, or or yeah. the views of that twenty percent. The two who didn't want to go to that restaurant are are you know being ignored. Well, that's just the way it works, right? Most of the people wanted to go there, so you go there. And yeah. this doesn't really come up in municipal politics either, because there isn't a party system in municipal politics, so people don't Not seem in to. Not Ontario, anyway. Yeah, mm. so don't seem to object. Yeah, in in places where there isn't a party system, they don't seem to object to the idea that a, if there are three people running for mayor and one of them gets 40% of the vote, they get to be mayor. Mm -hmm. And they yeah. don't get to be mayor for 40% of the next four years, they get the whole four time, years. right? The yeah. entire four years. And nobody seems to think that that's in need of reform. It's, 
It's a function of the system that we have, I guess, and the dynamics. Yeah. Well, and, and I think just, it does play into an overall um, dissatisfaction. With right. the, and the feeling, and again, a legitimate feeling in some cases that certain views and certain positions and certain parties aren't getting the representation that their supporters and people who care about those issues feel they should. And I completely understand how that's frustrating. I'm just not sure the answer would be to kind of go back into the electoral reform minefield because, man, that was, you know, a year and a half that I don't want to ever live again. And I'm sure there anyone else who followed his quote would probably feels mm. the same way. All right. We have been hearing from many people on social media about our question today as well. Let's go to some of those comments now. Remember to use the hashtag CPACVote2019. This person writes, given the health of Canada's economy and the looming boomer wave and low birth rate, we need to invest now while we can and while money is cheap in infrastructure and our social and economic systems. Miles writes, bad idea to be running deficits when the economy is running on all four cylinders. It may be small and manageable, but won't be once the next recession comes. Keynesian economics is you run deficits during downturns and surpluses during good times, not deficits in all parts of the cycle. Heather writes, the growing deficit under the Trudeau Liberals worries me a lot, and he's pledging to spend millions more foolishly. I'd be voting conservative, I'll be voting conservative for a government that won't spend more than Canadians can afford. And Amanda writes, they matter, but not that much. Canada needs to spend to get where we must go into a greener economy and repairing our infrastructure and particularly fixing all First Nations water issues. We've waited too long already. Thank you for those comments. We are open to your thoughts at any time. We have a couple of phone lines available now if you want to phone us. You can also email us at haveyoursay at CPAC. .ca. Let's take a call now from Mark in Toronto. Hello, Mark. Hi, thank you very much for having me on your show and for your analysis today. Okay, thanks for your call. Go ahead. I um, just wanted to say uh, briefly, um, the Liberals want a majority on electoral reform, and a lot of people do get it. And I think you should check out, the listeners should check out, and viewers should check out Fair Vote Canada for clarity. Um, so I'm going to say on that topic, because now, I'm going to be one on your panel for it. I am for it. Just wanted to say that. Sure. And, Go ahead. Um, getting on with my main question here, you guys can talk about that last point that I just said after this, please. Um, mainstream media is leaving out the Green Party and lots of their coverage. Um, you'll hear about the Conservatives, the Liberals, the NDP, but often in the headlines you miss the Green Party. Can CPOC give the Green Party fair and balanced coverage from this point on? Well, I think we have been. I'm not, I'm not going to be here to defend the coverage. If you have a concern about it, you can, uh, you can write to I'm us. Calling and, in. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, I'm just saying it's not my job to, rep to, to defend the, uh, the network or respond to that. Uh, I think we have been giving fair coverage. We've been talking a lot on this program about the Green Party platform, about Elizabeth May. We talked a lot. Uh, we go to every time Elizabeth May uh, is speaking publicly, we go to live coverage of that uh, or almost every time when we're able to uh, from a technical point of view. So, you know, uh, I'm, you're entitled to your view on that, but it is our intention to provide as much coverage of all the leaders as we can throughout this campaign. So um, thoughts on the mainstream media, though. Um, well, again, that's not, from you know, FIFA. it's not it's not up to me to you guys can't comment on that. Yeah, it's not, it's not really my job to comment on what other members of the media are doing, but if you have comments about it, you should, you should let them know. Thank but you for you your call, Mark. The you don't know the about? No, I actually, you know, I think um, based on what I've seen, I have not noticed a, a, a lack of balance, and I would say that I think the Green Party, given the fact that they currently have uh, two, two seats in the House of Commons, or they did a dissolution, uh, that they're getting, uh, they're getting a fair shake in this election, given that they had two seats and every other party had a lot more than that. Uh, they're getting fair treatment in this election, I think. And I haven't heard any complaints from the Green Party about this, myself, anyway. Well, it's just my observation. So, okay. I you guys all the time. Yeah, fair Thanks enough. A lot. Thank you for your call. Um, it, you know, it's interesting that he used the term, you know, that the Liberals got elected to a majority on a promise of electoral reform because using the logic of people who want to eliminate first past the post, 
uh, you could say that they they did not, they, they didn't, did not get a majority of the votes, right? Yeah. They got a majority of the and seats, but not a majority of the votes. Uh, I just want yeah. to say, I am actually surprised by how much attention the Green Party is getting, and not in a bad way. I'm, I'm kind of pleased to see it. They are being taken, I think, very seriously as a force in particular regions, but also nationally. You know, now when you read a story about, say, every party's position on the deficit, if there's not a reference to the Green Party in a comment, it feels as though something is missing. Right. And that's new. That's a relatively new development in Canadian politics. The, the fact that we now have four, well, five or six, depending on if you include the Bloc and the People's Party. I suspect that Maxime Bernier's supporters might have a better case to make about not getting the same level of coverage, but the answer there would be, hey, you just joined the party, you know, show yeah. us you're more than a one-hit wonder and maybe you'll get the coverage going into the future, but at the moment we got our hands full. I haven't uh, been keeping track and I haven't been taking notes or anything mm -hmm. like that, but uh, my sense is whenever I see anybody in the media talking about what the leaders are up to today they or recapping, they, they list all four of them, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, that's been my experience anyway, so... Uh, that's just some feedback on your comment, Mark. Let's go to Guy in Vanier, Ontario. Hello, Guy. How's it going? Hi. Go ahead. I got a, uh, yeah, I got a couple of issues. One, one is uh, the deficit's got to get, uh, got to get, got to pay the debt. That's for sure. No doubt about that. In my mind, my heart. And another thing too is they uh, got to cut on certain things, but I'm not quite sure what. But uh, for sure, not the uh, medical, medical like uh, hospitals. Like, for example, uh, a friend of mine went to the Mournford Hospital. He waited 14 hours. So there was only one doctor at night, which that, that, I don't know why, but to me, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't never exists. Not here, not in Ottawa, not in Canada. That's one thing there. And another thing, too, that I didn't really like there, there were going to be uh, approximately 10,000 uh, school teachers going to be laid off whatsoever. That, I, don't, I don't agree on that either, because now the 10,000 is going to be laid off. Where, where are they going to go? Unemployment? You know what I mean? Like, where are they going to go? Like yeah, 10, that's, 000, uh, that's in the province of Ontario. Yeah, that's a projection yeah, yeah. in the province of Ontario uh, yeah. from the, I think, from the uh, budget office. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I don't agree on that, but that's the thing there that should be fixed, but I don't think it's going to be fixed. And another thing, too, is very important, i got to point out before I let you go, uh, all, all the candidates, they don't talk about, they talk about the middle class and the high class. They never talk about the poor people, which the majority of Canadians are poor. There's no middle class is sixty thousand dollars a year, approximately, right? Is that it? Well, it depends on your definition, I guess. Uh, but well, I, you know, I think there are measures uh, that that have been talked about. Maybe it's not enough, but there have been measures talked about uh, with regard to um, affordability. Uh, there, there are at least a couple of parties that are talking about raising the basic personal exemption on income tax um, in order to uh, to uh, reduce taxes for uh, disadvantaged Canadians. So uh, again, I'm not saying it's enough, but but there there has been some discussion around that. No, I heard about that. You're yeah. absolutely right about that. But it uh, seems like uh, somebody who makes like, uh, less than 20000 a year is considered a poor person like I am, you know. Yeah. Which, uh, not, not, none of the politicians talk about the poor people. They talk about the middle class and the high class. That's what yeah. I've been hearing. Which, honestly, there it's it's not. Uh, you should be talking about the poor people. Because, like I say, I'll repeat myself again. I'm sure that the uh, statistics. If uh, one of you guys in the panel right now, you know darn well like that, that uh, there's more poor people than middle class people or rich people. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess it depends on your definition of, uh, and I'm not sure that there is a consensus on the definition of any of these categories. But I think that, I think that by if you were to ask most economists, that the majority of Canadians are middle class, well, right? The term middle class. Yeah. Well, yeah. Guy, class. Guy, thank you for your call, though. I appreciate that. All right. Okay. And let's, Have a good day. you know, let's not forget, of course, that uh, in that familiar phrase the prime minister uses all the time, it's the middle class and those working hard to join it, And I think it, that right? that, that's actually important to note because he, he is absolutely right that parties don't really like speaking about measures targeted at lower income Canadians. They do have them, but it's always framed as, and this will help them become middle class. Right. It's never just, here is a thing that we're going to do that we hope makes your life easier. It's, here is a thing that we'll do 
that we hope will, you know, get you up the ladder. And that is, it, it's a consistent approach across all the parties. Yeah. But I can understand how you're, if you were in a situation where that's not a realistic uh, thing for you to look forward to, it would get frustrating. Sure. And, and the other thing that sort of proves that the majority of Canadians are in the middle class is the fact that the political parties mm -hmm. talk about them all the time because that's where they see the most potential for votes. If, if the majority of people were not in the middle class, they wouldn't be talking about the middle class so much. Right? And, and we should also mention, though, that there has been some uh, dedicated action toward reducing poverty, mm -hmm. in particularly child poverty, through measures right. like the Canada Child Benefit. Yeah. So it's not like it's not being spoken about at all. I mean, there is some there is some concerted effort being made there, and uh, the figure that they like to throw around is 300,000 children lifted out of poverty based on those measures, and uh, Statistics Canada has measured that. Uh, as of 2017, which was the last numbers that uh, we have available. So, Okay, let's take a call from Cheryl in Saskatoon. Hello, Cheryl. Um, I just, I'm calling to talk about the deficit. Yes. And did I, um, I, did I do think it's okay to run a deficit when you consider um, the Liberal Party's um, program, the, the um, Canada Child Benefit? I do think it's an expensive program to run, but it, it does help um, many families, and um, they do have that budgeted in their in that PBO that just came out. And from what I've noticed, I don't see any of the other parties having that calculation in their projections, and so I'm not sure how how reliable it is to take the other parties word that they're going to keep that program when it's not listed, you know, if it's a, going to be a deficit, a deficit to their plan. Okay. Cheryl, thank you for your call. Scott is calling from Westminster, British Columbia. Hello, Scott. Hi there. I just wanted to, uh, I guess in terms of the deficits, um, I think there's good debt and bad debt. And if you, I mean, if I were to take out a student loan, it's generally considered good debt. I think it's the same thing with the government. Like they're, with this pipeline situation, I mean, the, depending on how that's viewed by the public, that could end up being like a huge anvil over the the head of the Liberals, so to speak. And we had kind of the same thing here in BC with the, there was uh, kind of the, the, the whole fast ferries scandal back in the, in the 90s there. And uh, basically that, that's when the media gets a hold of something like that, it just, the public can basically, they'll just focus on, on that, and that becomes that one issue that can really wipe a government off the map type thing. Um, so you're saying it depends hope, what you spend the money on, ultimately, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Fair enough. And uh, the other thing I was going to mention, I just wanted to, to quickly talk about compulsory voting. Mm -hmm. Very, um, which... In Australia, and I believe there's a couple other countries in the world that have that, and I, I think that's something that they should look at because I think they get like 90, 95% turnout or something. If you had that tied in with taxation, where if you, so every citizen needs to cast a ballot. That's, that's one of the major issues. I mean, if they leave it blank, that's up to them, but I, I think it would just improve overall voter engagement Right. And uh, anyway. Okay, fair well, enough. Thank you, thank you, Mark. Thank Thanks you for, for your call. Host. Thanks, Scott. Um, I find that debate interesting because I can see it from both sides. I, uh, obviously, uh, when voter turnout is 55% or something like that, a lot of people are very disappointed mm -hmm. and it's, it's not considered a good thing. Uh, on the other hand, I don't necessarily interpret that as a lack of faith in the system or people are angry and fed up because it could I, just be people who it, are you know figure the status quo is fine and it's, yeah, it's worth it, noting they that might, they might just be content compulsory right? and, voting was yeah. actually one of the issues that was discussed during the electoral right. reform and you'll be shocked to hear I'm sure everyone that there was no agreement it was one of those issues where yeah people can see the benefits there are advocates who will come out and argue passionately about how it really does help it makes people more engaged at the same time, there seems to be an overall leeriness on the part of the parties to, um, in effect, force people who don't actually want to be involved in the process to get out there and cast a ballot. So there are pretty good arguments on both sides. It's not something that I think is going to be on the top of any party's priority list in terms of changes yeah. that they make to the system. But it was, you know, at, at least it was discussed. It's something yeah. that we've sort of is on the radar.
The other thing I would note is I don't know that it necessarily does produce more engaged voters. If you right. look at the figures in Australia, when you compare, sure, it's 95% vote turnout, but if you look at the number of people who actually go out and join political parties, which is a good measure of actual political engagement, their rate of engagement is minuscule. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, and there's a question of whether those, those people who are now, who maybe there's... 25, 30 percent of, of Australians who otherwise wouldn't have voted if they're similar to Canada, who now are going to vote because they don't want the financial penalty associated with not voting, uh, are they then, because they're forced to vote, saying, okay, I guess I better do my homework and, and go out, you know, put, put the or do they there. just go in and, and mark the ballot, right? I, yeah. It's hard to know the answer to that question, I guess. But Yeah, and, and they have a preferential ballot as well there, so maybe it's just one, two, three, four <laughs> down, the, down the road. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I'd love to know uh, if it helps to have a last name starting with the letter A or B in Australia, for example. Uh, let's take a call from Joseph in Fort Erie, Ontario. Hello, Joseph. Joseph, go ahead. Oh, Joseph's not ready yet. Okay, we'll go to Mike in Sarnia, Ontario. Hello, Mike. Hello, I really enjoy your show. I just started watching it within the last uh, few weeks or so. Um, I think the biggest problem for people not voting is because there's so much corruption in government. And, and all political parties seem to be corrupt. They make all kind of promises. Uh, they break laws. And they get away with it. And people are so fed up and tired of it. it it's just uh, one scandal after another. And it doesn't matter which party gets in. And I also think that maybe what we should be doing is voting for um, the prime minister separate from the party because uh, if you look most canadians do not want uh, a lot of them would like elizabeth may and i'm not an elizabeth may fan but i'm just saying yeah it should be separate the challenge of course is then how does that work because you could have a house of commons with uh with uh, 10 Green Party members uh, and 150 Liberals and 125 Conservatives, but Elizabeth May is the is the Prime Minister. But how does she actually get anything done because she doesn't have enough votes to support her agenda, right? Well, I, I, I think that, that it's, uh, whoever you vote for in your riding, okay, should not be falling under party line uh, like we have now. We have uh, uh, Justin Trudeau telling the liberals how they're going to how they're going to run the party how they're going to vote and we see it so much corruption because of this i think it should be separate i don't know if it would work but that's okay. the way i feel thank you very much all right fair enough thank you um, you know, it's interesting, we're talking today in large part about the party platforms. The Liberals had their, their costed platform uh, uh, presented yesterday, uh, and that's how we got on the topic of deficits and debt. Um, I wonder if one of the factors sometimes is that in Canada, at least so far, there isn't a lot of, uh, there aren't a lot of stark differences between the policies of the various parties, right? There, are, These are... Uh, if you look at the conservative platform and the liberal platform, those I are have trouble keeping some of the promises straight. Yeah. I was going down a list the other day. I'm like, is that the liberals or is that the right. conservatives? It seems very similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think the general assessment is that it, most of the mainstream Canadian political parties, and I'll even include the Greens on this, probably agree on you know 90 percent of the issues, and on the other, in the remaining 10, it isn't even that they often have diametrically opposed goals. It's just they have different ideas on how to get there. So yeah, we don't really have those stark differences. Right. It really becomes more a question of almost marketing uh, of the leader and of the party uh, more than sort of a list of ideas. It again comes down to the credibility and who do you think would yeah. who do you trust? It's hard to argue that to... there is a huge change in direction that will result from one outcome or another in this election campaign, right? Uh, it's, people, and, and, there yeah. might be a change in tone. There might be a change in leadership. There might be a change in no in one emphasis. wants to get rid of the queen. Yeah. For instance, something yeah. like that. Like in we the don't United have those States, they're having a huge debate about health care right now. They're talking, you know, there's there's one party that's notionally trying to put up a wall uh, between the United States and Mexico, another party that won't. Immigration is a big topic. There are divergent views on what to do with the families of illegal immigrants, all of these kinds of things. And in Canada, it's... I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but to a large extent, it's, you know, is the best way to make life more affordable for Canadians to give them a tax credit in this way or to increase... Uh, a tax cut over yeah, here. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah. It, yeah. it's true. I, I, at the same time, I think we shouldn't 
you know, just gloss over entirely questions of implementation. Um, people can have similar ideas, but yeah. but the implementation is it's, really what's key. And yeah, it's, it's not to say that there aren't important differences, but yeah. ju they just don't seem as as stark. As existential. Yeah, as, well, and yeah. And I think it's perfectly legitimate for someone to make a decision based not so much again on what is in the platform, but if I put a person in office for the next four years, who do I think? Whose judgment do I trust? Who do I figure is probably going to make the right call on the you know? Issues that will inevitably come up that were never mentioned in the campaign, sure. and I think that that's you know that's also a, a completely viable way to to cast your ballot for the party that you think will be able to do that. Yeah, it would be nice if all that a government had to do in the ensuing four years was uh, just implement mm -hmm. what they promised to do in the 40-day election campaign, but that's not what ends they up. They might happening. end up renegotiating NAFTA. <laughs> right, exactly. That's not what ends up happening. So it does have to be. It does, to a large extent, have to be okay. Who do you hand over the keys to mm -hmm. and who do you trust, right? Yeah, and, and who can credibly get from A to B? Because um, that can mm -hmm. sometimes be a lot more difficult than, uh, than, it, than they would make it seem at election time. Yeah. All right, let's go to Walter in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Walter, go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, Hi. I was, uh, wanted to know about uh, like this deficit. Each party, like uh, Trudeau in the last election, uh, says he's going to balance the budget. Harper before that said he's going to balance the budget. Now the Conservatives are saying, oh, well, Trudeau didn't balance the budget. Like, don't they ever look back on what they did? Like, they didn't balance the budget. I don't think any of them will ever balance the budget. And a second is this carbon tax. How can a tax stop carbon? I haven't, I've talked to different political parties about it. They don't seem to know. They just, oh, tax the carbon. But what are they doing with the money? Like, are they investing it in ways to stop carbon? They, they well, it's a combination of things, right? So in simple terms, obviously part of the purpose of a, putting a price on carbon would be to disincentivize certain behavior and incentivize other behavior, obviously discouraging behavior that, that uh, creates emissions and encouraging behavior that doesn't. Uh, that's part so, of it. All, it. all it's going to do is raise the price of everything. It's not going to stop any carbon. But the idea is, is that in raising the price of everything, it will create incentives for people to both produce and purchase products that, uh, that don't create emissions and therefore don't cost more. Right? That's the theory behind it. There are people who, do, who, who believe deeply in it, and there are people who, who don't believe it'll work, but that's the principle behind yeah, it. I, I don't think it'll work at all. And, uh, like, back to the, the deficit, though, like, uh, I don't think that any of the parties that get in have a chance of balancing the books. Right. There's just no way. They, they okay. all promise they will. They get in there. All of a sudden, oh, we, we're sorry we can't do it this year. We'll try next year, next year. And they never, ever do. They just get it higher. Thank you for your call. That's, I mean, it, it can be argued that's certainly the pattern in, uh, if you look at the last 50 years of Canadian politics, apart from maybe eight or nine years in the time that Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin were prime minister, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. most governments in this country in the last half century have run deficits, right? But it, it, it comes down to choices that, that they make as well. I mean, this, this current government made the choice. Um, they said we could uh, get back to balance or we could continue to invest while money is cheap, and that was the decision they ended up taking. Um, I don't know that they very effectively communicated that, but it was a choice that, you know, we, we are on a path to balance. There was uh, costing documents that showed that, if, you know, if they had not gone and increased the spending they had planned to do, they could have gotten back to balance, but it was a choice that they made right. that... Um, and, and we need to... It could to, be argued yeah. it's always a choice. Well, exactly. they're, right? they're yeah. also choosing, I mean, all governments choose whether or not to increase their revenue stream by raising taxes, sure. by figuring out more ways to get money into the system. So I think that that's important to consider as well when you're sort of looking at deficit and debt reduction is, yeah, there's always the notion of cutting and, and, and reducing spending, but it's also, you know, it's legitimate to argue that you could also look at increasing taxes, and that's something that actually the NDP is, I think right now, will probably the 
Green Party. I'm going to say probably the Green Party. But I think the NDP is the only party that is sort of really going after this notion of raising an income tax on the very, very wealthy. Now, the Liberals have sort of played around on the edge of that with their luxury tax and the idea of taxing purchases that are over $100,000, boats, uh, planes, and cars. But the, and they actually, in the last campaign, campaign, in the last election, they did campaign on the idea of making the wealthy pay more tax. But that is also a legitimate way to say, hey, this is one way we're going to get back to balance. It's by increasing the tax load on people who can afford it. And that's something that isn't focused right. on as much. Yeah. yeah. And right. Alberta is a very good example of that, where, you know, they, they've assiduously eschewed uh, a sales tax in the mm -hmm. province, even though every single economist has been calling for one as a, as a stable revenue stream. But they refuse to do so, and um, well, we could. And, I mean, they, a government could raise the GST here by one percent, and sure. that would solve a whole heck of a lot of fiscal problems. But yeah, well, in fact, it could be argued that it'd be uh, that it'd be more effective than raising taxes on the wealthy, because some mm -hmm. people have argued there aren't enough wealthy people to raise enough money. Mm -hmm. It's more of it, it. It does produce some revenue, and it, it's a good uh, symbolic gesture to have richer people paying more, tax. more taxes, but uh, but it, it doesn't produce as much revenue as you would think just because there aren't enough of them, right? And, and this is also an example of implementation. The NDP are promising this wealth on, or this tax on the super wealthy, but they're basing it on a tax system that doesn't exist in Canada. We don't tax households or families in the way they in the way they do in the U.S. So, in order for them to implement that, they would have to essentially create a whole new tax system in Canada. So, again, this goes back to um, credibility around implementation. Right. We're expecting NDP leader Jagmeet Singh to be part of an event within moments from now. You're looking live at a restaurant in Vancouver where he is about to hold a local media roundtable. So, it appears as though. Everyone has gathered there, and um, they're getting ready for Jagmeet Singh to arrive. We'll go there live as soon as that begins. In the meantime, let's take a call from Phil in Red Deer, Alberta. Hello, Phil. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I just want to get back to uh, the electoral reform that uh, had been discussed in the past. Yeah. And the thing I notice about federal elections now, especially this one, is you've got six parties dividing up the vote, and all that can... All that can come from that is a succession of minority governments. And let's face it, minority governments don't get things done. And if they do, they're held hostage by the other party that hold, that props them up. And they're not the party that was elected into power, so to speak. So that's now, are you, are you arguing against electoral reform for that reason, or are you arguing... No, no, I'm, okay. I'm saying we need to pare down the parties right. and, and get to a point where, unless you command... So many uh, seats, you don't get to have a seat at the table. I'm sorry. Like three parties was plenty when I was growing up. I'm 61 years old. So you had the Conservatives, the Liberals, and the NDP. That seemed fair. And you could, m most elections, yeah. you'd come up with a majority government, which is the way this country should work, is which is the way everything should work. That leads me into my next point which is this consultation with Indigenous Canadians. I have no problems um, listening and sitting down and talking with the Indigenous people and hearing their concerns. But the, the Indigenous people only make up about 4% of the total population of Canada, and they're telling the other 96% of the country what you can and cannot do. That's unsustainable. You can't have that. You'll, yeah, never, I get guess another, the... you'll never get another pipeline built. You'll never get another dam built. You'll never get another bridge built. Foreign investment is leaving this country at an alarming rate. And how are you going to get all that money back? Yeah, I think uh, the argument that uh, people who are in favor of Indigenous rights and Indigenous authority over issues like pipelines are making is not that they represent the majority of the population. Uh, it, it's They, uh, they, re they only represent a significant... Minority of the population. I know, but that isn't saying, the point, they're right? Telling that, the other ninety-six percent of the population, how, how, how the country's going to work? That's not yeah. a, again. That's, that's not, not the. the, the way that's not the basis for their argument. Is not is not uh, numbers uh, in terms of population numbers. Well, All right, we are. We're going to have to stop there. Thank you very much for your call. Let's go live now to Vancouver, where Jagmeet Singh, the NDP leader, is participating in a local sure, media roundtable. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awesome. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, 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 no. 
Hi there. Hi. Very nice so to meet you. Welcome. Lisa? Very nice to meet you, Lisa. Amber, very nice to meet you. My friend, can we get uh, just a cloth right here for this? Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jenny Kwan. I'm the NDP candidate for Vancouver East, running for re-election for Member of Parliament. And, of course, uh, I want to welcome all of you to beautiful Vancouver East, where everything happens right here in this <laughs> riding. And um, I am so delighted that uh, my leader, Jagmeet Singh, is here today. Um, as you know, he's been crisscrossing across the country, talking to Canadians, raising the issues that matter for Canadians, and really bringing their stories forward so that Canadians can know that politicians, that the NDP, that we are listening to them, that we are bringing forward policies that matter to them, and he's been the champion of everyday Canadians mm -hmm. from coast to coast to coast to coast. And then, of course, sitting next to uh, Jigmeet is my great colleague, Don Davies, uh, the uh, NDP candidate for Vancouver Kingsway, running for re-election. And you know what? This guy's working so hard out there. You see a sea of orange all over Vancouver Kingsway. <laughs> it's true. And I'm just so delighted that you're all here. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to ask our leader, Jigmeet Singh, to say a few words. And then afterwards, uh, we'll take questions uh, from the media. Uh, and then food will be brought to the table for everyone to enjoy. And welcome once again to Vancouver East and Jigmeet. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dajia Hao, Woshi, Jagmeet Singh. And I'm uh, really honored to be here with Jenny and with Don. Uh, great examples of what you get with New Democrats. People that fight for you, people that stand up for you, people that are in your corner, on your side, no matter what happens. Uh, that's what you get with New Democrats. And, and in this election, I really want to talk about um, our, our new deal for people, our new deal for Canadians. Uh, we've seen in Ottawa, for too long, governments have been working to make life easier for those at the very top. They make life easier for the wealthiest, the most powerful, and that makes life harder for everyone else, and people end up paying the price. We have so many examples. You know, just yesterday, Mr. Trudeau walked away from universal pharmacare. He walked away from families that are desperate for help with the cost of medication. He said to them, help is not on the way. They're not going to get help. Instead, he would rather protect the profits of the powerful pharmaceutical companies, protect the profits of insurance companies, rather than help families. And that's been a trend. It's been an ongoing trend. When it comes to housing, where here in the Lower Mainland, people are struggling to find a place to call home, Mr. Trudeau says, you know, I'll, I'll call it a crisis, but I won't actually deliver any real action. And in fact, is investing 19% less than conservatives as a percentage of GDP. 19% less. So he criticized Mr. Harper, called him out, said he wasn't doing enough, and Mr. Trudeau acknowledges there's a crisis, but is spending 19% less than the Harper government, than the Conservatives. So Mr. Trudeau is going to try to scare you into settling for less. He's going to scare you into settling for less, but the reality is Mr. Trudeau is not in it for you. He's not in it for people. He's in it for the powerful and the wealthy. Last year, he gave $14 billion away to the wealthiest corporations so they could buy corporate jets and limousines, while families were struggling and couldn't afford their dental care. We're saying... It does not have to be this way. Our new deal for people includes investments in people, investing to expand our health care to include pharmacare for all. That means if you need medication in our country, you would use your health card, not your credit card. It means covering 4.3 million Canadians who don't have any dental care coverage with a plan to cover them immediately. Those families who earn less than 70000 who have no coverage, will be covered immediately with our plan. That means for a family of four, who need to have some cleanings done, maybe a cavity or two with their young ones, that could save $1,200 for a family a year. This is massive savings. We believe investing in people. Now, conservatives are going to say to you, we'll save you a little bit of money, we'll cut your taxes, and they might put a couple of dollars in your pocket. But we also know that while Mr. Scheer might cut taxes a little bit, he's going to cut the services that you and your family need, and that's going to cost you thousands. What we're providing is a plan to invest in people, saving families thousands of dollars with their medication, with their dental care, with housing, with child care. We are going to invest in people. And for young people who are worried about the environment, we want to tell them that we are going to fight as hard as we can with every ounce of our skill, our effort, and our resources to tackle the climate crisis. You can count on us because we don't work for the rich. We don't work for the powerful. We work for you. 
Thank you so much, Shishi, Doce, and I'm ready for any of your questions you might have. Yes, we'll have 338 candidates uh, today. We were actually ahead of the Liberals. We had 338 candidates ready to go before the Liberals did. And uh, it took us some time, but we're proud of the results. We wanted our candidates and our team to reflect Canada. And one of the things I made a commitment to was to ensure that we had more women reflected in, parli in, in Parliament. And to do that, you need more women as candidates. And on our team, I'm proud to say we have 49% of our candidates are women. Uh, a record-breaking number. We're really proud of that. We also have one of the most diverse uh, team that the NDP has ever presented. Probably one of the most diverse teams of any party. Uh, nearly 25%, one quarter of our team, are racialized. We've got a record number of Indigenous uh, leaders that are running for our party. 8% of our candidates are Indigenous. That includes chiefs of communities, uh, activists, and academics and leaders. We have a significant number of members from marginalized communities, including the LGBTQ. We have a team that reflects Canada. It looks like Canada, and I'm proud of that. It took some time to do it, but the results are we're going to put forward a team that will help us overcome the barrier, which is not enough women ref reflected in our federal politics. And we're going to build on the, the champion, like Jenny Kwan, who, who broke barriers in her own right. And we're going to build on that with candidates that reflect what Canada really is. The poll shows that there's a very tight race between the liberals and conservatives. You mentioned earlier, if we have a minority government elected, uh, you're not willing to work with conservatives. Have you changed your position? And if uh, that's the case, what do you believe your uh, party can do, or what can you offer to the uh, voters? Uh, I've only ruled out one party, and I've said because of a host of reasons, uh, conservatives cut all the services that families need. For me, that's non-negotiable. Uh, families need more service, more investments, not less. And the Conservatives have consistently shown that they're going to cut the services that families need. Mr. Ford in Ontario, Mr. Kenny in Alberta, both of them immediately upon becoming premiers cut health care and education. And the families that I talk to tell me they need better investments in education, more investments in health care, not less. So I've ruled out the Conservatives. I'm running to form government. I'm running to become prime minister. Uh, but I'm, I've made it clear that I would not work with the Conservatives. So the, the, BC, uh, the new deal for BC, so why is that only for BC, or are you putting out uh, other new deals for other provinces? Right, well, we wanted to put forward a, a unique plan for BC, uh, because BC has got a, a number of unique challenges. We've got a new deal for people that covers issues that impact everyone across Canada, but there's some sp very specific things we want to tackle in BC. One of the things that we know the housing crisis is a crisis across Canada, but people in the lower mainland feel it probably the worst. The housing crisis is sharpest and most severe here in the lower mainland, and in fact across BC on the island. I heard the story from many people, heartbreaking stories about people who were working hard and couldn't afford their rent, and they were just on the edge, and now they can't afford their rent anymore, and they ended up, uh, one woman ended up in a tent. She's living in a tent in her backyard of her friend's place because she couldn't afford the increase of rent in her place that she was in before. And she said, I can, I can do this if it was just me, but I have kids and I'm worried about them. And so for families like that, we're providing a rental subsidy of up to $5,000. That's going to help half a million Canadians who are just on the edge and they need a little extra help to stay in their homes while we build that half a million non-market housing that people need. So uh, we've got a plan specifically for BC to talk about the coastline, uh, salmon, wild salmon, and protecting wild salmon and some of the challenges like money laundering that are uniquely um, being experienced in BC more than anywhere else. We want to tackle those and give uh, the people of BC a clear commitment that we're not going to ignore them like people often feel. BC often feels ignored. Now that they've got a leader who comes from BC, uh, you can count on me to be there for you. Can I go back to that? Uh, you have ruled out uh, Conservative Party. So have you... Uh, um talk to uh, Mr. Trudeau, like, on a personal base lately, and if Liberal get re-elected as a minority, so what are the uh, areas you believe you can work with him? And just now you mentioned about the platform, there's a certain areas that you're really uh, not happy with what Liberal is doing, especially for the, uh, the huge deficit. Yes. So what do you believe your party can do, and why the voters in BC in particular won't vote for you? Well, I want to make it clear, uh, my plan is, and what I'm running for, is Prime Minister of Canada. I want to form government because I want to help out people and make their lives better. I don't feel like people should be afraid or be scared into settling for less. 
And that's what Mr. Trudeau is going to say to people, that he's going to say he's not perfect, he's going to say a lot of promises, and he's going to admit the fact that he made a lot of promises in 2015 and didn't fulfill them. But he's going to scare people with Mr. Scheer and say, you've got to settle for me. I don't believe people have to settle. But anytime we've achieved anything significant in our country, anything massive in terms of coming, stepping forward in a way that helps people with universal pharmacare or universal Medicare, or when it's come to old age security and pension, it's been new Democrats that have led the charge and fought and pushed for those results. So I'm saying to, to the people of British Columbia and all of Canada, if you want someone to push for what you need to make your life better, you need more new Democrats on your side. Because we don't work for the rich, we don't work for the wealthy, we work for you. And if you want someone who's going to fight for pharmacare or childcare, or you want someone who's going to fight to improve the immigration system, if you need someone who fights for you, it's new Democrats who always provide that support, who provide that undying, unfaltering commitment to stand up for people, not the wealthy. So you said you are going to build um, uh, half a million new homes to, to tackle the housing problem. And what's the quota for BC? Is there a quota for BC? Uh, we haven't rolled out the specifics of, of where we would build the housing, but we know that there are communities that are in most need, and that's where we need to put a lot of emphasis. So where there's a demand and where there's need and where there's the most uh, impacted by the housing crisis, that's where we need to make the investments. But it's going to be across Canada. And uh, our, our approach is this. We want to tackle the root causes of the housing prices going out of control, which is speculation and money laundering. These are some of the causes that are driving up the cost of housing. But we also know that wherever there's affordable housing in any other country, there's uh, an option for affordable housing that's rental, that's non-market, and cooperative. And that's why it's so important to create that option. Any other country where, where the housing is affordable, people have a choice between buying a home or renting something that is affordable in the non-market uh, market. And that's what we're going to focus on, the non-profit market. When we talked about uh, making sure young people have a bright future and tackling the climate crisis, one of the best ways for us to tackle the climate crisis is investing in public transit. So we put forward our Courage, uh, courage to Act, uh, our plan, uh, our power, power to Change uh, plan. In French, it's uh, Courage d'Agir, our Power to Change. Um, that plan is going to be focusing on, on uh, public transit. So we want to invest massively in public transit uh, initiatives. I met with uh, Mayor uh, Kennedy Stewart and talked about our commitments to investing in public transportation and that means electrifying transportation investing in more uh, higher quality in terms of access and accessibility and coverage so that it can cover people they can choose to use public transit it reduces emissions better quality of life a better life for people in the city so the, um, what's your different uh, what how different is NDP's uh, um, uh, climate change plan compared with uh, the, Green, uh, the Green Party's uh, mission possible? Sure. Um, many people have said, many experts have said that, that our plan is the best plan, and, and I'm proud of that. I, I acknowledge that the Greens also care about the environment and that there is a shared concern around the urgency. Where we differ is Ms. May has said that she would support, that she would be open to supporting the Conservative government, that she'd be open to supporting Mr. Scheer. So she's willing to negotiate things like health care and investing in housing and investing in people because Mr. Scheer is very clearly going to cut those services. She's open to that. Uh, I've made it clear that that is not on the table for me. I don't feel it's appropriate to negotiate things like health care or to negotiate with things like uh, housing. Those are priorities and I wouldn't give them up, unlike the Green Party is willing to give them up. Um, and so I've made that very clear that my position on how we move forward has to be we tackle the climate crisis, but we also need to tackle the problems that people are faced with, with health care and housing. NDP's platform has been about not fighting for the rich and fighting for the people. And I'm just wondering for the small business, for example, in BC, um, there are a lot of Chinese immigrants who are involved with um, their small business. And it seems like they have been at vote the voters for a conservative. And from your perspective, how would you convert them? in a sense, back then. Yes, well, I, I want to make it clear that while we think that the wealthiest aren't paying their fair share, we believe small and medium-sized businesses and, and middle-class and low-income families are paying their fair share, so we would not increase taxes on them. We'd keep the small business tax at the same rate. And what we're saying to small businesses, they, they know they, they have workers. 
in their businesses that don't have coverage. And they can't afford to give them coverage because it's too costly for those small businesses. And we know that when businesses, uh, when families have coverage, when workers have coverage like dental care and medicine coverage, they're healthier workers, they're able to produce and contribute more, and then small businesses benefit from that. So our argument to small businesses, we're gonna help you out by making sure your workers are healthier, that they have the health healthcare coverage they need. Also, businesses, small businesses have to pay out of pocket. They're self-employed, they don't have coverage for medicine, they don't have coverage for dental care. Uh, with our plan, they would get this coverage immediately. And so instead of having to pay out of pocket for private insurance, we believe Canadians should count on our healthcare system to be there for them. So a small business owner shouldn't have to pay out of pocket for healthcare coverage to cover medication when we can cover that for them. This would save massively. This could be on average $600 a year of savings, but if you don't have any coverage and someone in your family is sick, this could be thousands of dollars a year that you save. For the dental care coverage, for example, for a family of four uh, that needs uh, you know, the average care in a year, which might include some cleaning and maybe a cavity, that could be about $1,200 of savings that our plan would give. So we will save families and businesses a lot more than the small amount that Mr. Shear will promise in tax cuts we will provide in services that will save families and businesses a lot more. What we heard from the uh, community, uh, from the Chinese community in particular lately, is the issues uh, the voters are concerned is quite different from the mainstream. For instance, uh, the number one might be like uh, immigration or refugee and foreign policy. Like, given that Jenny, uh, you know, she's from the, the Chinese background, uh, many people were concerned if we have a new government. So what are we going to position us, Canada, with China under the current situation? And also for our strong allies like uh, UK and Europe, if UK after Brexit, what, how can we deal with that? So can you answer those? And sure. especially uh, to clear that, because sometimes we heard from the, the leaders, they are different when they're selling the message out to the English uh, audience and to the uh, ethnic groups. Sure. Uh, thank you for the question. With, um, with respect to China, that is, in a very, that is a very important relationship. Uh, Canada took the lead in creating an open dialogue with China as one of the Western nations that was the first to, to have diplomatic uh, communication and relations. Uh, this is something that we need to build on. We need to take that relationship very seriously. And what we've seen over the past two years has been that Mr. Trudeau has not taken that relationship seriously. There's been inconsistent and uh, a lack of coherency in the approach to China. What I would do is make sure we've got a serious and committed, coherent and consistent policy and approach to China. It's something that is very important to, to the people in Canada, but also as a, as a, a significant world uh, leader, it's important for us to have those relationships that are, that are serious and that are based on a consistent, coherent foreign policy. Uh, with respect to Brexit and, and our other allies uh, around the world, uh, we need to make sure we've got open communication, open diplomacy. Um, the Brexit challenge will present a, a problem for, for trade relations because we will no longer have the European agreements that will work. So we'll have to negotiate with uh, the UK to develop an agreement. With those agreements, one of the di distinctions that we make as New Democrats, our, our focus isn't on making a trade deal that benefits the wealthiest, the people at the top. We want trade deals that benefit workers. So if there's an agreement that might increase the wealth of a rich corporation but doesn't actually help create jobs, then that's not a deal that we want to sign. We want to make sure that our trade agreements are based on fairness, that let our Canadian manufacturers and businesses compete on a level playing field, and that would be our priority with respect to how we negotiate trade deals. So you've been very uh, critical of uh, U.S. President Donald Trump. And, yes. Uh, and uh, maybe the only leader that has uh, says, that has said that you would like to see uh, uh, Trump impeached. So if you are elected, how are you going to deal with uh, the U.S. Uh, Canadian relationship? It's also a very important relationship for Canada. It's a relationship I take very seriously. If it's still Mr. Trump that's in office, we know that Mr. Trump has used bullying tactics very regularly and is bullied to the detriment of Canadian workers. And the only way to stand, stand up to the bully is to a bully is to be strong. And I will be strong for Canadians. We know with the recently negotiated trade deal, it has hurt Canadian workers. The trade deal will rise, will increase the cost of medication, has made it harder for farmers, and does not have any protections for workers or the environment, which means we'll not have a level playing field. I, I feel that was a bad negotiation that hurt Canadians. 
and that would ensure that we negotiate deals that benefit workers, that benefit Canadians, not the wealthiest, but the people who actually go to work. And to down. Sure. And can you say a couple words about affordable housing in the across the Canada and the down is in your writing? Sure. I'll start with uh, across Canada, and then Don will yeah, yeah. respond to about his writing. So across Canada, this is probably one of the issues that comes up the most frequently. Uh, it is an issue across Canada, from Atlantic provinces all the way to Vancouver Island, uh, and north and south. We hear this issue everywhere. And the issue is a matter of people can't find a place to live, so there's scarcity. They can't find a place. If they find a place, there's an affordability question. It costs too much. And in some places, there are, there are homes, but they're not of good quality. So there's a quality problem as well. So when we talk about building half a million new homes, this is a bold plan because we have to make up for 30 years of inaction. Mr. Trudeau and, and previous Mr. Harper have not made real commitments to build new affordable housing. It's been three decades since the federal government has actually built new affordable homes or partnered with municipalities, not-for-profit agencies, provinces to actually build affordable homes. So we need to make up for that time by building massively. In addition, we have to get at some of the root causes, which is speculation um, and money laundering. So we'll tackle those root causes and we'll invest massively in new affordable homes. Well, I, I'm, I'm so proud of our leader's uh, position on housing. I think the NDP has the strongest policy to deal with what I think can be called a crisis. You know, there's a lot of issues in politics, but some of them are fundamental. And making sure everybody has a safe, secure, affordable place to live is extremely important. It allows people to participate in our society, to go to work, to raise their families. And I, I think Vancouver is almost the epicenter of the crisis in Canada. Uh, I hear this every day on the doorsteps. And, you know, to me, as, as, uh, as Jagmeet has said, um, we've had a generation where the federal government has not participated in, as a senior level of government. It's going to take all levels of government, federal, provincial, municipal, working together with the community, with builders, with, uh, with NGOs, um, to build the units. The best way to get affordable housing is to build it. And so, you know, uh, I'm very proud of our platform where the NDP says we're going to build 500,000 units of housing over the next 10 years, half of those in the next five. And, um, you know, and I'll, I'll conclude by saying in my riding, we still see the benefits of the very strong federal program from the 70s and 80s where they built co-ops so whether it's Caslow Gardens and Still Creek or Trout Lake or the Flesher Co-op, um, there's about 15 co-ops in our riding um, that were built with federal funds. And that just stopped in 1993 when the Liberals cancelled that program. So we want to get those programs back up mm -hmm. and running. That's right. And I think uh, uh, we'll start to see um, some, some hope to people who are very desperate for housing now. We've seen people have to leave Vancouver. Um, families are being broken up. Employers. I was in the Kanji Noodle House on uh, Kingsway near Joyce a couple days ago. They told me they can't find staff to work in the kitchen. Why? Because the people can't afford to live in Vancouver anymore. So it's actually affecting our economy as well as families. So um, I know the housing plan is really, it's a huge plan, but where does that money come from? Yeah, it's a matter of choices. So if I want to break down the choices that governments make, we'll make better choices and we'll also increase revenue. We take our budget very seriously, but I want to give you one example. So last year, in one year alone, Mr. Trudeau spent $14 billion on the fall economic statement just to give the wealthiest corporations the ability to buy corporate jets and limousines. He bought a pipeline for $4.5 billion, and he also wrote off, forgave, $6 billion in corporate loans. If you add that up, that's almost $25 billion of spending, and not a cent of that went to the people that need it. It all went to the wealthiest corporations. To give a contrast, one of our plans to invest in dental care that will cover immediately 4.3 million Canadians. It's a very bold plan. It's a government insurance plan to cover dental care. It will cover all the services that people need. That plan costs $856 million, according to the PBO. So basically, Mr. Trudeau paid for 25 times that program in one year. So that's a matter of choices. But on top of that, we're also looking at revenue. So we would ask the, the super wealthy 
those who have fortunes of over 20 million to pay a little bit more to invest in these programs. We'd close some of the tax loopholes that exist, the CEO stock option loophole, as well as offshore tax havens. Offshore tax havens could amount as much as $23 billion in lost revenue, uh, according also to the PBO. So we've got a lot of opportunities to increase revenue. We'll ask the wealthiest corporations to pay a little bit more and the highest, highest income earners to pay a little bit more. And with those revenues, we'll be able to fund these programs that are, these services that are so important. I know the NDP government wants to stop the pipeline uh, expansion. So uh, Trudeau government keeps saying that the project maybe can earn the money for government. Do you, and, uh, do you think it's uh, true or uh, false? Uh, I don't see the evidence, and we've seen a lot of experts say that, say that they don't see any evidence that this is actually going to create a, any sort of massive revenue. It's going to cost a lot of money up front. It already cost almost $5 billion, 4.5, to buy it. To expand, it might cost another 15 or $16 billion. So all ends, it would be $20 billion that would be a cost. That means uh, going into debt. And we don't see how the revenue would anyway offset that $20 billion. Uh, instead, if we invest in clean energy and renewable energy, we know that for every dollar we spend for clean and renewable energy, we have massive return in the economy with new jobs created. So that's our plan. We want to take that money, end fossil fuel subsidies, stop the Trans Mountain, and instead invest in clean energy, renewable energy, which will create way, far more jobs, but also more sustainable jobs that will be there for the long term. That you have a childcare uh, announcement today. Yes, we do. Yeah. Can you, uh, yes, for sure. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, really proud of this announcement. It's uh, to build on the work here in BC with the $10 a day pilot project, which is a, a, a massive change for a lot of families. I met actually a father on the way in, and he told me his wife and, and him were, were relying on their line of credit to pay for childcare because it costs so much money, and they were going into debt, and that he got into the pilot project and it transformed his life. He no longer is going to debt. He's saving thousands of dollars. This is a, a, a new lease on life. He basically said it, it breathed life back into him that he was able to have this project. So we want to build on that and take it across Canada. So it's a $10 billion investment over four years. We want to help finance or fund half a million new affordable childcare sp spaces. We also want to put in place better protections for the early childcare educators, so training and good pay. And we want to put in law, our goal is to achieve by 2030 universal uh, child care that's affordable, so it'll be no cost for families that can't afford it, and very low cost for those who can, to create a, an opportunity for everyone to have access to child care when they need it. Uh, reg uh, regarding the current poll, it looks like maybe uh, we have a minority government coming. So will you have any plan to uh, have an alliance with one uh, government, I mean, one part. That's a very fair question. I appreciate it. So I'm running to form government. I'm running to become prime minister. So I'll put it this way. If I'm a prime minister in a minority government, I'll work with anyone who's willing to put in place universal pharmacare, investments in housing, protecting our environment, the child care plan that we have. So if someone wants to work with me to put that in place, I'm ready to work with them. I've only ruled out working with the conservatives because they want to cut services and hurt families and cost them a lot more. And I said that that's not on the table for me. What's your comment on the PPC party? People's group. Yep. Yeah. In general, my comment is uh, their platform is one that's very divisive. They're spreading a lot of hatred. They're saying things that are purposely trying to create division and inflame tensions. They're using words like mass migration, which is not based on any evidence. They're saying things purposely to create division and hate. And that, to me, is not welcome in Canada. Uh, we need to find ways to come together. We can have differences, we can have disagreements, but our differences and disagreements shouldn't create tension and inflame hatred the way Mr. Bernier is doing. Regarding on the, I, I, know, I remember that you mentioned that you don't agree that the leader of PPC should be invited to the TV That's um, debate. Right? So is it a part of the reason that um, you just mentioned that because they, they have a lot of hate that's spreading out and, but, I remember the leader of PVC have said that they need a platform to discuss their Im Im immigra immigration policy and other, other policy that they have. Um, do you think they 
Are they are worthy to have this platform to, to have a discussion with you? Uh, not, it's not because they're not worthy to have a discussion with me, but I don't think that those ideas are worthy to be given a platform. The ideas that are purposely divisive, that are purposely hateful. For me, it was a difficult decision because I do believe in freedom of speech. I, I'm a lawyer by training, so I believe in people being able to have a, difference, a different opinion and to be able to debate and have that conversation. But where it goes too far is where the purpose of your, your, your speech is purposely designed to, be, to inspire hate. Um, Far right-wing groups have signed, are the ones that signed and support Mr. Mr. Bernier. They're they're designed to have hatred grow towards new Canadians, towards people who are immigrants. Uh, they're purposely creating tensions, and that to me doesn't have a place in Canada or in our political discourse. And on that, I know that there is a rising xenophobia in uh, in Canada, right? So, um, do you think? This xenophobia caused by a rise of um, foreign house buyer or other other question in in Canada. Like, what, what is the sure. cause of it? Um, we're, we're seeing. It's complicated. There's a lot of different causes. I think that some of the things that Mr. Trump has been saying have emboldened people who are hateful, and he said things that have emboldened people that have. Um, white nationalist beliefs and he's, he's emboldened those folks. We also know that online there's a lot of radicalization that's happening and so one of our commitments is to tackle online hate. There is a lot of, there's a lot of evidence mounting that on, in different platforms online there's forums being used to encourage and incite hateful messages and we've got to tackle that. Misinformation is also adding to it. When people put out information falsely about what's happening that creates uh, tension or negativity towards new Canadians or refugees. That misinformation is also fueling the hate as well. And so that's why we've also put forward a platform commitment to tackle online distribution of false information, how we need to hold those social media platforms to account. Um, we also, I think, another area where we need to focus, if people cannot find housing, if they can't find a good job, and they're worried in their life, people who are feeling insecure are more likely to be exploited by some leaders to say, oh, you can't find a house because of these new Canadians. You can't find a house because of these refugees. And so they become exploited because they're afraid. So I feel like if we invest in better housing, better health care, we make sure people have good jobs, we can tackle the economic insecurity or fear so that people don't have, aren't exploited because they're afraid of the future. Right now we are also doing a leadership, uh, I mean, interview, but we still cannot see uh, the Prime Minister. Oh, no. So, uh, do, you, do you think it's an uh, election tactic or...? Uh... Uh, I think he's afraid of his track record. He, he said a lot of things, he made a lot of commitments, and he broke those commitments. And I think he's afraid to, to face those, that track record. And a lot of Canadians are disappointed. A lot of people were hopeful that he would bring in some changes, but he didn't. And instead, he continued to help out his wealthy and powerful friends instead of helping out families. He turned his back on pharmacare, turned his back on childcare, turned his back on making investments in housing, spending less than even the Conservatives. He's made decisions that hurt families, and I think he's afraid to stand up, or he's afraid to be held to account to his track record. Yeah. Every time uh, when we do this election uh, story, every single uh, <laughs> we, we always talk about encouraging people to come out to vote, yes. especially for people from the ethnic background. And is there any uh, new plans or platform your party putting in place uh, now? Because we're in the you know the dead, pretty much not much time left now. How to encourage more people from ethnic background or you know non English speakers as their first language and young voters come out to vote? Yeah, it's it's an ongoing struggle, and I think a lot of folks are feeling a little bit cynical. They're feeling that they were hopeful in the last election in 2015, and a lot of their hopes were, were dashed by Mr. Trudeau. Young people were excited because Mr. Trudeau said the right things about the environment, and now he bought a pipeline, exempted the biggest polluters, continues to subsidize the fossil fuel sector. So young people are feeling really let down. The big marches that happened, the big strikes that happened just a couple days ago, those were strikes demanding that world leaders take action. They were strikes against Mr. Trudeau and his actions to buy pipelines and to not tackle the crisis. So I know that it makes people feel less inspired or less willing to want to vote because they give up hope. 
I want to inspire in people hope. The reason we're in this position is because governments like Mr. Trudeau's and the Conservatives have worked for the rich, and the rich have benefited. The wealthiest, the people at the very top have benefited. I want to benefit people, and I want people to know if you vote for us, if you if you support New Democrats, we're gonna not, we're never gonna let you down. We're in it for you. We fight for you. We want to make your lives better, and I'm hoping that'll inspire people to come out and vote. I'm seeing more and more people coming out. I'm seeing a lot of young people that see themselves reflected in our campaign come out to our events. A lot of people that are new Canadians or racialized people or ethnic communities are seeing that they're reflected in our campaign because our candidates, our team looks like what Canada looks like. And we're talking about the problems that people are faced with. And we're giving solutions, real solutions. And I'm hoping that'll inspire more people to vote this time. Can Jamie add on that, especially yes. from the Chinese community perspective? Yes. Um, the um, ethnic minority community, I mean, I, let, let me reframe this. I've always said for so long that I am so happy to be here in Canada. We are the faces of the world. And so from that perspective, shouldn't our elected officials represent the faces of our community? And so I am so proud of our campaign, of our leaders' work in recruiting the broad range of candidates uh, to represent us here in Canada as their elected officials in this election. And so we have 49% of the candidates that are women, right? I mean, 50% of the population here in Canada are women. Our party comes closest to representing that reality. Mm -hmm. In terms of the ethnic community, 25% um, of our candidates are from the diverse communities. So we are the faces of our community. And so when we think about elections, when we think about policies, when we think about governments, it is so important that we have people from all walks of life who have your experience reflected so that they can bring your voice right to the decision-making table to be your voice in the House of Commons. This is what I've done in all of my life uh, and, uh, and, and, and with our leader, Jagmeet, who is the first uh, ethnic minority leader in a national party here in Canada. I think that's significant as well. And so as we work towards really building diversity, especially in the face of the rise in racism, especially in the face of the xenophobia that is happening, we have to stand united and say no to that force. We have to be inspiring to people to say it doesn't have to be this way, mm -hmm. that we don't have to be beaten down over and over and over again, and to say that discrimination and racism have a place in our society. We can rise up and say that there can be positive change. And this is exactly what the NDP and what Jagmeet has demonstrated over and over and over again. And we will continue to do this until we get the job done. We mm -hmm. all deserve it. All Canadians deserve this. So my question for Jamie. Just yesterday, more than 1,500 people uh, that's met on the downtown and they free Hong Kong. And I remember you going on Hong Kong. Can you say a couple of words about this situation? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, I'm an immigrant. I was born in Hong Kong. I immigrated here to Canada with my family back in uh, 1976 with a family of eight. And so Hong Kong has a special place uh, in my heart, uh, and it is my birthplace. Watching what's going on in Hong Kong is absolutely heartbreaking and devastating. You know, to see the violence, to see the situation uh, that is um, happening in Hong Kong. And so we all, I think, want the same thing, and that is to say for peace to be restored in Hong Kong, stability to be restored in Hong Kong. I do think that it is absolutely vital that the Hong Kong administration, and I urge them to take action, to bring forward a uh, independent inquiry into the violence that's taken place, uh, and so that we can get on to the path of bringing stability uh, back to Hong Kong. And at some point, if we want, we can also uh, make sure you get some food as well. <laughs> so, so with uh, Jenny, you previously mentioned the, the uh, uh, papal uh, uprising, in, uh, especially in this community. Mm -hmm. So uh, in a, a month ago, I remember, if I remember correctly, the, there's a foreign, I mean, a, a, Caucasian, Caucasian woman who uh, present painful speech towards the Chinese community, and she basically walked away without any apologies or nothing. So, uh, and uh, police says there's no charges on that, uh, and they added um, if the, the 
outrage uh, she get from the uh, on online, like for example, social media. Uh, actually, those are considered cyberbullying. So, the message that's presented is basically like uh, you pres uh, you you uh, present hateful speeches. You you won't be able, you won't get charges. But if people who outrages on you uh, at the hateful speech uh, or whatever you do. Uh, then they consider cyberbullying and less chargeable. So, uh, do you do you have any plans on like, for example, like changing the law or something that give punishment on hateful speech like that? Um, well, I'll I'll tell you um, my experience. I've been in electoral office um, for twenty six years. This is my twenty sixth year of being elected uh, as a uh, parliamentarian, and I'll tell you this: in all of my years in elected office. I've had hate hurl at me, I've had hate mail, um, but mo almost all of the time, that is anonymous. People actually don't tell me who they are, they hide behind screens, they hide behind fake names, and I don't really know who they are. But a couple of years ago, I had white supremacists come right up to me, to my face, to tell me to go back to my own country to tell me straight to my face that they don't like me because of the color of my skin. They told me right to my face, because I am not white, that they don't want me here. This is our reality of what's happening. I think that the Trump administration, in uh, emboldening the racists and the discrimination to come forward, we're experiencing it right here, right now, in our communities today. And so, to that end, what, what do we need to do? First off, actually, I think we need to stand up to bullies, as our leader Jagmeet has done. We should not be afraid of even the President of the United States to call it for what it is and speak truth to power, to allow all of us to have a safe place in our communities, to be free of discrimination. In terms of Canada, in terms of what we need to do, we also need to give voice to the people as well. Imagine, for me as an elected official, that I would face that kind of abuse what happens every single day for everyday Canadians mm -hmm, and immigrants? Mm -hmm. They experience it every day and they have no place to bring forward their voices and their concerns. They are afraid to do so. So we need to actually allow for that, uh, uh, for allow for people to come forward, for their stories to be heard, for it to be reported. I actually think Canada, we actually don't have a hate crime unit across Canada. How is this possible that we don't actually have that mm -hmm. in every yep. single province, in every single community? Those are the kinds of things that we will take action on, right. right? We need to be clear about what constitutes hate and what is not. And if you are someone who's out there trying to spread hate and, and actually incite hate, we need to take action on that. It's not just the Chinese communities, it's all of us together. The Jewish community continue to be the highest um, targeted community mm -hmm. in the sense that they crimes. have the highest hate crimes against them. Mm -hmm. We have the, um, uh, the, um, Muslim, communities. the Muslim community mm -hmm. who have the highest increase in hate crimes mm -hmm. happening. Right? And the Chinese community, the Indo-Canadian community, the Japanese community, all of us are faced with that. So we need to band together and to say this cannot be allowed, mm -hmm. that we will not tolerate hate and we will not allow for a platform for people who want to spread hate and spread misinformation mm -hmm. to generate hate. Mm -hmm. And as our leader has said, as Jigmeet has said, right? that what we need to do when people face the uh, issues and challenges that they face, the affordability questions and so on, our job as elected officials is to make sure that government invests in them as well, they invest in all of us. We don't need to pit communities against community to say who needs more. The people who don't need more are the wealthiest peoples, the biggest corporations, the top 1%, they don't need more. Let's redirect our resources to the people who actually actually need more. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to pit communities against communities. The immigrant community helped this built this country. And we need to continue to to ensure that uh, that follows through. And we also need to remember that the indigenous peoples, the first peoples, they were the people who suffered the gravest discrimination. And we need to move forward with that and ensuring that mm -hmm. not only are we consulting with them, but they also are at the decision-making table to make decisions. So together for the path forward to say a better Canada is entirely possible. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always have to be 
the red door or the blue door. There is this bright new future through the orange door. Let's <laughs> charge through it, make it happen, because when we do that, it's for all Canadians and not just the top 1%. Mm -hmm. Jenny, sorry. I was just going to, if I just might add, uh, as a Caucasian man, the incident that you described was a, a Caucasian woman who who hurled what I think can only be described as hateful, racist comments at a, a woman of Asian descent. And I, I personally was disappointed in the decision not to charge her. I think she should have been charged under the criminal code under the hate crimes. Uh, because I think it's important, as Jenny just said, that we take a stand and that we send a clear message that that kind of behavior in public, in front of the, the woman's daughter, is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. It's easy to talk about tolerance, but you must back it up with action. And the RCMP is the, uh, is the police of record in Richmond, that, which is where the incident occurred, I think. And, and I think the federal government, I was disappointed that the federal government did not direct the RCMP to consider laying charges against that woman to send a clear message that that kind of behavior, that kind of hateful commentary in public is not acceptable. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it was a missed opportunity uh, to send a clear message to all of us that that, that we, we can and expect better in our country. Yeah, yeah just want to follow up on, on this question. Uh, currently, the Chinese community is organizing a commit, uh, petition online asking people to sign to support, uh, to demand the elected officials to do something. Um, it's just linked to this incident. Do you all support that? And if you get elected, what do you think you could do? Sure. I, I can give you our commitments on that. So one is we've got a commitment to have a hate crime department uh, funded in all jurisdictions across Canada. It's a commitment we have. That's a, a, a gap that exists right now. There's not a specifically... Um, a fully committed department on hate crime in every jurisdiction. That's a, a gap in our in our system right now. The second thing is the the hate crime laws right now uh, don't allow for charges to be laid in cases where they should be laid, uh, where there is clearly hate motivated and and commentary or language which would meet uh, uttering threats that would be a criminal offense and it's colored by by hateful speech directed towards someone because of who they are. So we need to have better laws and we also need them to be applied better. And that means ensuring that there's the right training in place to know when this type of incident happens, it meets the definition of, of a hate crime and it should be charged as such. So these are the examples of where we need to actually call out and denounce hate. It has no place in our society and we can back that up. And with New Democrats, you have a commitment to have a, an ally working to fight hate wherever it is with the criminal justice system, with our legal system, but also with policies that will specifically help out people. Google different phrases. Sure. Today is orange shirt day, and so one group of people that we can ignore is the indigenous yes. people, right? Yes. So what NDP have for the indigenous people? Uh, we've got a, a host of really serious commitments. Uh, this is probably one of the, the biggest injustices that exist in our country, that the first people of this land don't have access to basic things like drinking water. They don't have access to equal funding. Uh, when it comes to child welfare, education, and they don't have uh, adequate housing, and quality housing. And we've got a, a federal government, Mr. Trudeau, who has taken Indigenous kids to court, even after the Human Rights Tribunal has found that Canada was wrong. He's appealed the decision multiple times. And at the end, the appeals were not successful because it was clear that Canada breached its responsibility to make sure Indigenous kids had equal funding. Over the past five years, over 100 Indigenous kids died in, in child care, in Indigenous child care. That's 100 Indigenous kids that were, that were stripped from their families, that lost their lives because of inadequate funding. And we still have Mr. Trudeau who's challenging Indigenous funding decisions in court. That is wrong. So what we would do as a starting point, we're not going to take Indigenous kids to court. We know and respect they deserve equal funding, and we have to fund them equally. We need to make sure that every community has access to clean drinking water and uh, good housing and access to education. I don't accept in 2019 any excuse with the wealth that we have as a nation, with the technology that we have as a country, that we cannot ensure that every Indigenous community has clean drinking water. I just do not accept any excuse that we can't get that done right away. 
Oh, sorry. We're just getting a, a signal, sorry, from uh, from Laura. Maybe I'll take your last question, uh, but we're, we're have to cut off because of our time, but yes. we'll and take your last question. Uh, any comment about the Green Party? Because right now it looks like Green Party and NDP really competitive. So uh, any comment about Yeah, I'll, I'll, make it, I'll make a really clear distinction. Um, I've made it clear that I would not support Mr. Scheer or the Conservative Party because they're going to cut the services that family depend on. And we have so many examples when Conservatives cut services. Ms. May has said she's willing and she's open to working with Mr. Scheer. That means she's willing to negotiate things like education, health care funding. Uh, she's willing to negotiate housing. For her, those are not priorities, given the fact that she said she's willing to support Mr. Scheer. I don't have that same position. I believe we can tackle the climate crisis, and we also have to tackle things like people who can't get access to dental care and to medications and to affordable housing. That's the difference between us and the Greens. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Please dig in and enjoy some of the food. Okay. Let me know if there's anything vegetarian that I can yes, nibble on. Um, Jagmeet Singh, the leader of the New Democratic Party, speaking to reporters at a media roundtable in a restaurant in Vancouver today. Alongside him were NDP candidates in the Vancouver area, Don Davies and Jenny Kwan. So some interesting things coming out of that media availability. Lots of questions about who Jagmeet Singh would work with in a minority parliament situation and about other issues as well. Uh, we only have a few minutes left in this edition of Have Your Say, but joining us once again, Dale Smith, freelance journalist and author, and joining us for the final few minutes of the program, Peter Mazaru, deputy editor of The Hill Times. Some quick reaction, Peter, to what Jagmeet Singh was saying there. Well, it was, uh, it was his uh, video photo op, and he hit a lot of the points that I'm sure he wanted to. Talked a lot about housing, talked a lot about the diversity of his candidates um, and, and some of the hate crimes that mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately seem to go with that. Um, and he talked about the Conservatives uh, more than I was expecting, actually, you know, doing something similar to what we're seeing from the Liberals, comparing them to provincial Conservatives and casting them as sort of a scary choice. I'm not sure strategically what the benefit uh, uh, is for the NDP doing that, but uh, I think some of it came in response to questions about who he would or wouldn't support right. in the minority parliament. Yeah, Dale, as you mentioned before, a lot of what Jagmeet Singh has been talking about, in uh, technically speaking, falls under provincial jurisdiction, right? Right, right, and that makes it harder for him to be able to promise things um, without a, a plan for implementation, and implementation is, is something we really should be uh, buttoning leaders on. Right. All right, let's take a call from Deborah in Ottawa. Hello, Deborah. Uh, um, I just wanted to comment on Trudeau. He's a little baby in a man's body. He says, you got to watch what he says. He's going, to, he's going to help out all the seniors that are 74 years old, okay? My income is $1,711, and I have $2,876 worth of dental bills. If I go to a foot clinic once a year, it's $75. I only take two prescriptions, and I can't get through the $100 deductible. My, my, uh, the, I had $57 for food, but I got to go pick up these things that are $42. If you go to get glasses, and it's a prescription, it's $400. Now the bus pass is going up. I might have to actually walk now. Just get rid of that and walk in the area where I live. I used to go down to Bayshore at Walmart. These people, this guy, does not know how people are suffering out here. Okay, thank you. Thank me. you for your call. I'll stop you there just because we're short on time. Margaret is calling from Peachland, British Columbia. Hello, Margaret. Yes. Uh, Hi, go I'm ahead. Just, yes. I was um, thinking about the deficit and uh, taxpayers' dollars, you know. To me, taxpayers' dollars are sacred dollars, and when a party doesn't take that and they just helter-skelter spend that money or even steal it like they did in the sponsorship scandal, that's what the Liberals did, and you don't have people that really are in the know. Look at Cretchen made this big announcement, now our health care system is free. Well, it's anything but free, but it's covered by tax dollars. You know, they don't respect 
tax dollars. When I collect money for some organization, I look after that money better than I do my own. Okay. And that leads me to wonder why was Trudeau so hell bent on helping SNC Lavalin? Okay, Margaret, I'll jump him? in. I just want to squeeze in as many people as we can. Dave uh, in Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, Dave, you're going to have to keep it short because we're almost out of time, but go ahead. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short, but I just want to talk about the deficit also. Uh, there's no way that all this millions and millions and millions of dollars that Trudeau has handed out all around the world to benefit Canada, not one bit. Where has he got the means? And now he's promising to give them more and more millions out around the world. Where is he going to get the money from? If he's counting on my tax dollars, I don't even know if I'm going to be working next month. I'm okay. going to be on unemployment. All right, Dave, so thank you for your call. Appreciate that. Uh, Peter, uh, we've been talking about this issue of deficits and, and uh, the national debt. Quick comment from you uh, in 20 seconds or less on whether you think that's relevant in this campaign. I think it all depends on the framing. I've talked to people who will, who will say they look at the deficits promised, say $20 billion. That's a crazy amount of money. Put one way, uh, you know, the federal revenue is about $330 billion a year. It's about 8%. That's like a right. household taking on a few thousand dollars of that a year. It's not nothing, um, but it's not the end of the world. So it depends okay. on how you look at it. Peter, thank you. Appreciate you stopping by. Dale, thank you for being with us. We'll see you again okay. soon. And thank you for watching. We will be back with another edition of Have Your Say tomorrow at 2 o'clock Eastern Time. See you then.